time. We're going to get it. All right, let's look at the light reactions, folks. I'm going to draw here a thylakoid membrane. Just an enlarged version of it. Pardon, pardon, I'm going to stick a lot of stuff in here. Once again, the light reactions occur in the thylakoid membrane. Their purpose is to absorb light and produce the energy-rich molecules ATP and NADPH. And in most cases, we're going to have two separate light reactions with distinct photosystems and stuff like that. But what we got here, to make the light reactions, we have two of what are called photosystems. These are pigment and protein complexes that actually absorb the light. And there's a photosystem 1 and there's a photosystem 2, distinctly different with distinctly different functions. 1, photosystem 1, makes NADPH. In fact, let's put that down here. Let's call. Okay. And photosystem 2 is, leads to the making of ATP. So we've got two photosystems, two different types of functions. Okay. Surrounding each photosystem, I'm going to diagram this in a little bit, is another set of protein pigment complexes what are called the light harvesting complexes or LHCs and there's different kind for each photosystem. The light harvesting complexes increase the surface area for absorbing light. They act like an antenna. You have more surface area and then they channel the energy into the photosystem. So it's kind of like, have you ever seen a satellite dish, you know, for your satellite TV or something? you got that circular thing about this big. You have at the center of that horn or feed. You pick up the satellite signals, channel them all into that horn, and then you get your TV signal. The light harvesting complexes act in effectively the same way. You have more surface area to pick up and absorb more light. And then you channel that energy into the photosystems. We also have, with each photosystem, associate electron transport chains. Each photosystem has their own. The electron transport chains, of course, what we're going to do is we're going to take the electrons that are ejected from chlorophyll, pass them down this chain to a final electron acceptor, releasing energy in the process that we can use to make ATP, NADPH, whatever. Okay, and of course, we're also going to have, last but not least, we have ATP synthetase molecules here. Okay, so let's make a photosystem, just diagram a little bit. I'm going to stick right over here at ATP synthetase, the magic mushroom. And once again, it works by facilitating diffusion of H. Okay, so this is the thylakoid membrane here. Now let's look at these photosystems. Each photosystem is a very large <laughs> complex that spans completely through the membrane, consists of about a score of different proteins and enzymes and stuff like that. There are multiple copies of many different chlorophylls in each photosystem, plus other pigments, luteins, xanthins, carotenoids, all these kind of things you hear is the trees are turning color now, at least the ones that haven't fallen, leaves haven't fallen off. They turn color because they stop chlorophyll production first, and then you see all the other pigments that those trees have. So we have multiple copies of many scores of individual pigment molecules scattered in these photosystems. But somewhere in there, there's one very important chlorophyll that's called the reaction center. Each photosystem has one. It's a single chlorophyll that's complex with a particular protein. That protein kind of bends and warps the chlorophyll a little bit. This chlorophyll is the one where you can kick electrons off of it the easiest. So basically, we're going to channel all the energy of light into that reaction center, and the electrons will be ejected from the reaction center chlorophyll, 
rather than from the, uh, any of the other pigments. We channel the energy to the reaction center, and that's where your electrons come off. <coughs> so here's your photo system. And once again, these are huge complex, about 15 or 20 nanometers across. It's enormous for a protein complex. The thylakoid membrane is jammed full of these. Once again, it's about 80% protein and 20% lipid by weight. We're sticking as much of this stuff into the thylakoid membrane as we could possibly fit in. It's more like photosystems, light harvesting complexes, enzymes, each surrounded by a little molt of lipid. So it's really more protein than lipid in these membranes. Now, surrounding each, each of these photosystems is multiple copies of a single membrane-spanning protein that has about half a dozen pigments in them. Different kinds of pigments, including more chlorophylls, more lutein's, more xanthins. Each one of these is a small protein, about 30,000 molecular weight, half a dozen or so pigment molecules in each one of them. And these form the light harvesting complex. We'll just call them LHCs. There's a light harvesting complex for photosystem one and a different one for photosystem two. The idea behind these is once again, this gives us more surface area to absorb light. We channel the energy into the reaction center, and there we go. So that's just basically how I have a roadmap of what this thing looks like. Now, if light happens to hit it, it's going to be light. Light happens to hit any one of these pigments. We're going to channel that energy ultimately by passing ultimately to the reaction center chlorophyll in that photosystem. And that's where we see the action taking place. Now, this is basically what this uh, view of what the stuff looks like in the membrane. But let's see the process. We're going to have to diagram this process in a different way than we did with the mitochondria. We're going to make something, instead of <coughs> mapping things out, yes? What's the second one to the right? Pigments. What did they say? Pigments. Pigments. In other words, each <laughs> light harvesting complex protein has about half a dozen separate pigment molecules inside it. And that's where we absorb the light. Okay, well like I said, the usual way of doing this is instead of mapping things out as they're arranged in the membrane, we're going to map things out kind of in a certain of energy levels. So we're going to have a very different kind of setup than what we saw with mitochondria. Okay, this represents energy. When you're chemically inclined, this is Gibbs free energy. If you're not chemically inclined, don't worry about it. All right. And we're going to kind of map this out. Now, the way we're going to do this is it looks like a, a Z that's kind of, in fact, they often call it the Z scheme that's kind of lying on its side. We're going to start out here with photosystem 2 first. There's a reason for that. And I'll put over here a reaction center, which we'll represent as RC. Okay. Now, that chlorophyll, of course, has a lot of electrons around it, large, rather large molecule. Two of those electrons are relatively weakly held and can actually be kicked off the chlorophyll molecule by absorbing light. Now, light comes in somewhere, right? It gets absorbed by one of the other pigments, by a pigment the light harvesting complex, whatever the case is. But ultimately, the, the energy is transmitted to that reaction center chlorophyll. Now, light is a form of energy. And in some cases, light if a molecule absorbs light, it can actually kick electrons off it. The photos of, you know, you go to a store and you have those doors that open automatically. How does that work? There's a photocell there. If you interrupt this beam of light, you're going to get it, or rather, if beam of light reflects back from you, reflects back to a photocell, electrons get kicked off the metals in the photocell, they get amplified, it powers the motor that opens the door. Any kind of camera that has an automatic exposure, it's got a photocell in there. 
electrons are kicked off by absorbing light. Now, in these cases, these artificial photocells are generally metals and stuff like certain kinds of metals, but organic molecules, at least some of them, can do the same thing. So what happens? Light gets absorbed, gets transmitted to the reaction center. The reaction center, chlorophyll, kicks two electrons off. Now, when you remove electrons, good morning. Long night. When you remove electrons from a molecule, of course, they are attached to the molecule. It takes energy to pull electrons off of a molecule. So if we kicked electrons off of the chlorophyll, it means that these electrons are being pushed up to a higher level of energy. <coughs> and you can thank light, the energy of light, for doing that. <coughs> Now, these electrons are kicked off the chlorophyll. They will get picked up by an electron acceptor, a small organic molecule called a quinone, a very hydrophobic molecule. And it is easily reduced. In other words, it easily picks up electrons from other things. So what happens is we have an electron acceptor. So this absorbs these electrons. Now, in a series of oxidation reduction reactions, we're going to pass these electrons down an electron transport chain. The electron transport chain consists of both small organic molecules, mostly what we call quinones, these kind of ring-shaped, kind of complex hydrophobic molecules, and also a number of proteins in a certain sequence. So we pass electrons to one thing, and then it passes electrons to something else, and so on. It's very similar to what we saw in the case of the mitochondria, except we're relying more on small organic molecules and less on proteins than we did in mitochondria. So we pass it down this electron transport chain. And it goes from one place to another, to another. But one of the most important things in the photosystem, too, is this big enzyme complex. This enzyme complex is known as the cytochrome B6 slash F complex. Now, cytochromes are iron-containing blood-red protein. We remember cytochrome C was a little shuttle between the second and third complex and the mitochondrial electron transport chain, little blood-red iron-containing protein. Cytochrome B6 and F are kind of similar. They're a little bit different, but they're kind of similar. Iron-containing and they pick up and donate electrons. And there's a whole bunch of other proteins in this complex. But we'll say cytochrome B6F complex. And about a dozen proteins in this. So it's a large complex. Just like we saw in those big enzyme complexes in the mitochondrial electron transport chain, there's many proteins in here with irons, iron sulfur groups, things like that that can pick up and donate electrons. So we pass the electrons around within this complex, dropping down in energy each time we do it. So we pass these guys around, just like we saw in the big, what's my call? Okay, now, when we do this, the cool thing about this, this enzyme complex can actively transport, they use that energy of these oxidation reduction reactions, and we actively transport H plus from the stroma across the thylakoid membrane into the thylakoid sac itself. So we're going to have H plus active transport. This is what we saw in the mitochondria. So it goes from the stroma, and then goes into the So now we pack the thylakoid interior full of H plus, about 80 times as much H plus as, as the stroma. And that energy is going to ultimately be used to make ATP. This is the same chemiosmotic mechanism we saw in the mitochondria. We actively transport H plus across a membrane, store it at high concentration, facilitate diffusion of H plus through the ATP synthetase, powers ATP production. Same mechanism that we saw in mitochondria. So clearly this is a very ancient mechanism. It goes back two and a half, maybe even three billion years. 
And this is why photosystem 2 makes our ATP. It makes it the same way mitochondria do. Chemiosmotic mechanism. Now we still pass the electrons a few more electronics, a few more electron acceptors. Now, when we look at the mitochondria, eventually we have to pass those electrons to a final resting ground, a final electron acceptor. If we don't do that, they, then we just clog up this entire electron transport chain and nothing happens. In mitochondria, we pass the electrons to oxygen. If you don't have oxygen around, everything backs up on the electron transport chain and you die. At least unless you're an anaerobic organism that can get away without it, but most of us can't. Okay, so we have to have a final electron acceptor for photosystem 2. So where do we pass those electrons to? Well, we have way down here, photosystem 1. And it has a reaction center. Slightly different than the one that we saw in photosystem 2. But what's going to happen is this. Photosystem 1's reaction center also absorbs light and kicks off electrons. We have to replace those electrons, so we're going to do it courtesy of photosystem 2. We're going to see where replacement electrons come for photosystem 2 later on, because that's actually very important. But when we kick off electrons off the photosystem, we have to replace them with electrons so we can kick them off again. You can only knock two electrons off of the chlorophyll, after that, you can't knock any more off. It just takes too much energy to get the, rid of the rest of the electrons. So we, every time we knock electrons off these chlorophylls, we've got to replace them. We're replacing the ones for photosystem 1, courtesy of photosystem 2's electron transport chain. We'll see how we replace photosystem 2's electrons in a few minutes. Okay, so now we're to photosystem 1. Once again, light gets absorbed somewhere. Usually some of the other pigments, it gets channeled into photosystem 1's reaction center. And once again, we kick two electrons off. And it goes off to another electron acceptor. We pass those electrons down another electron transport chain. Some organic molecules, some small iron-containing proteins. You want all the gory details, it's in the book. But the basic idea is we've got an electron transport chain here. We pass in these different components. And now we put it to a final point. Here we go. Now we have to pass the electrons to a final electron acceptor. And that final electron acceptor is a large enzyme complex known as NADP. Reductase. Now, the term reductase means it's an enzyme that catalyzes the reduction, the addition of electrons to something. And what is that? NADP reductase. It reduces or adds electrons to the coenzyme NADP. So what happens? We take, ow, I hate this job. <laughs> they call they get this cheap Crayola chalk I call Crapola chalk. They make good crayons, I guess, but their chalk is horrible. It just doesn't, it doesn't stick together. Okay, we're going to take the coenzyme, NADP+. Plus. We're going to take it H+. Plus. We're going to take those two, add these two electrons to it, and now we make NADP. One H plus goes in there. One electron goes here, the other goes here, NADPH. That's our second energy-rich molecule. So photosystem 2 makes ATP. Photosystem 1 ultimately passes electrons to NADP plus to make our second energy-rich molecule, the NADPH. And not only that, this is how we get rid of the electrons on that electron transport chain. So not only are we getting rid of electrons we don't want anymore, we're also making our second energy-rich mole. So that's what's sometimes called the Z scheme because it looks like a Z lying on its side. And that's a major thing of photosynthesis in both light reactions in both bacteria and in eukaryotes. But, folks, 
we got one question here. Where do we get replacement electrons for this reaction center? We haven't covered that yet. The reaction center of photosystem 2. We kick two electrons out, we have to supply it with some new electrons. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to kick any more electrons off. We see that photosystem 1 gets its replacements from photosystem 2. Where does photosystem 2 get it from? Well, there is a remarkable enzyme in part of photosystem 2. What it does is it takes a water molecule. It grabs the water molecule and tears it apart, grabbing two electrons from the water molecule, passing them to the reaction center, and then we end up with 2H plus, we torn electrons off of each of the hydrogens, and an oxygen atom, which of course combines with another one to make oxygen gas. And oxygen gas is essentially a byproduct, a waste product of photosystem 2's reaction center. The reason plants produce oxygen is not for our benefit. Plants produce oxygen because they tore a water molecule apart to get their hands on replacement electrons. <laughs> and then this stuff goes off into the atmosphere. And this is where we get the source of oxygen on our planet. Now, an interesting thing about Earth history. There are, and some microbes still do photosynthesis, and what they do to replace electrons in the reaction centers or to pass electrons to NADP to make NADPH, this is what we sometimes call oxygenic. In other words, making oxygen photosynthesis. And that's what most cyanobac cyanobacteria plants do. But there are some kinds of photosynthesis that do not produce oxygen because they use different places, different sources of electrons. And that includes things like <coughs> using hydrogen sulfide instead of water. Same basic principle, you tear hydrogen sulfide apart, leaving H+, plus, grabbing two electrons, and depositing elemental sulfur as your waste product. Organisms that do this are called sulfur bacteria. In fact, many are purple because they have a purple colored chlorophyll. Where do you find these guys? Around volcanic vents, because that's where you find hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is quite toxic to most organisms, including ourselves, but it's necessary for the photosynthesis of some of these sulfur bacteria. Problem is, now the advantage of using hydrogen sulfide is a lot easier to tear apart a hydrogen sulfide. The sulfur-hydrogen bond is a lot weaker than the sulfur-oxygen bond. So ripping a hydrogen sulfide apart is a piece of cake compared to trying to tear a water molecule apart. So this stuff probably evolved before the normal oxygenic photosynthesis. Problem is, if you do this kind of strategy, it means you have to hang around volcanic vents. And let's face it, living next to active volcanoes is not the safest thing in the world, right? It's the folks in Japan, you know, and in the Philippines and stuff like that. It's a dangerous environment, and it's a limiting environment. If you evolve the ability, instead of using hydrogen sulfide, using water, all you have to be is in a place where there's sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, and you're a happy camper, which means you can occupy most of the planet instead of being stuck next to nasty, dangerous volcanic vents. Other things can oxidize metals. There are some that oxidize iron, oxidize copper, and a few other kinds of things. So, and here again, these are the oddball photosynthetic microorganisms. We still do find them on our planet right now. We still do find them tend to be in fairly limiting and rather nasty environments. But the vast majority of photosynthesis on this planet is this stuff. Cyanobacteria plus photosynthetic proteins plus plants. Okay, now, 
The development of this literally changed the world. You know, we're talking about right now all the pollution that we do, all the stuff we're throwing into our atmosphere contributing global warming. Carbon dioxide, methane, all this kind of stuff, right? And it is having a global effect on the world's climate, in fact, rather rapidly. Okay, we're not the first ones that polluted our planet from our byproducts. These guys were the first ones that did. When this process developed, it's estimated two and a half, three billion years ago, some people think even further back. The world had no oxygen in the atmosphere, or maybe one part in a thousand compared to nowadays. So you have a planet that's got no oxygen in the atmosphere, it's got nitrogen, it's got lots of carbon dioxide, maybe about 50 times what the current levels are, maybe even 100. A little bit of methane, natural gas, produced mostly by methanogenic bacteria. And now, so all the organisms living on planet Earth in those days were anaerobic. There was no oxygen around, so you wouldn't need oxidative metabolism or anything like that. Most of them were poisoned by oxygen. And now along come these upstart cyanobacteria. And what are they doing? They're pumping out oxygen into the atmosphere. Now oxygen is, since it's so highly electronegative, it's extremely reactive stuff. I mean, the name oxidation originally referred to oxygen combining with something. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, these photosynthesizers are pouring this toxic, corrosive, reactive gas into the atmosphere. At first, we see geological evidence for it. What happens? It goes up in the atmosphere, it starts oxidizing rocks and stuff like that. You used to see deposits of things like, you know, iron, metal, and stuff like that on the ground. And then all of a sudden, stuff gets oxidized, turns into rust, because now there's oxygen in the atmosphere. So for a while, these guys are pumping oxygen out. It's oxidizing rocks, dissolving in the ocean, oxidizing iron in the oceans, and all that kind of stuff, and basically being removed as fast as put in. But these photosynthesizers aren't going to stop there. They're proliferating all over the planet. All you need is water, carbon dioxide, and light, and you're a happy camp. So after a while, these guys are putting out oxygen at such a rate that geological processes can no longer get rid of it fast enough. So what happens, the oxygen level in the atmosphere climbs up, and that is nasty for anaerobic organisms. And probably this stuff that happened about 2.4 billion years ago, what they call the Great Oxidation Event, that was a global catastrophe at that time. It killed off a lot of these anaerobic organisms. They're getting poisoned by this stuff. Oxygen, horrible, nasty stuff. It's actually at high levels of being toxic to us. You breathe it like two atmospheres of pressure, you go into convulsions and die in a matter of minutes. It's still toxic. It just, the dose makes the poison. A small amount is okay. A large amount is bad even for humans. Okay, well, We've got this stuff in the atmosphere. Anaerobic organisms either had to go into anaerobic environments like underground, in mud and sediments and stuff like that, or they had to adapt to the presence of oxygen. They had to develop enzymes that would do, undo the damaged oxygen, it repair enzymes. We have these things now, they're called catalases, that break up hydrogen peroxide, which is a byproduct of reactions with oxygen. There are things called SOD, superoxide dismutase, that break up these oxygen-rich free radicals that are devastating the cells. If you get rid of the genes for those in any kind of aerobic life, that's lethal. We depend on these things to keep us from getting poisoned by oxygen. Even though we need oxygen in our metabolism now, the side effects can be quite nasty. So we got these enzymes to undo the damage. Plants have all kinds of antioxidant molecules that also reduce the damage caused by oxygen. And then some organisms, by playing around with electron transport chains, started to come up with the ability taking electrons from coenzymes like NADH, passing them to oxygen, and using the energy release to make tons of ATP. In other words, oxidative metabolism. 
It's very similar to the light reactions of photosynthesis in some respects. You've got electron transport chains, ATP synthesases, all that kind of fun stuff. The big difference is you're taking electrons from these coenzymes, passing them to oxygen, that gets rid of the oxygen, turns into nice harmless water, and then at the same time, you're also getting this huge energetic boost that you can make tons of ATP with. So it's much more efficient than aerobic processes. So in the presence of oxygen, if you can use oxidative metabolism, you are far better off than if you're an anaerobe by itself. So that was an adaptation to oxygen poisoning. But more and more, you put more oxygen in the atmosphere. Enough of it goes up to the stratosphere. It gets broken up by sunlight and forms ozone. You've heard of the ozone layer, right? Ozone absorbs deadly ultraviolet light from the sun really strongly. Now, that whole ozone layer, if you compressed it, it's about 30 miles up in the stratosphere. If you compressed it to normal atmospheric conditions, it would form a layer only a few millimeters thick. But that is mega sunblock. It blocks shortwave ultraviolet from the sun that would otherwise be extremely damaging and destructive to life because ultraviolet light is powerful enough to tear apart covalent bonds and organic molecules, damage DNA and stuff like that. That's what sunburn is. You're damaging your DNA, you're killing off, damaging the cells in your skin, they slough off, they hurt, they sting, all kinds of stuff. And you can get cancer, so how would that be exposed too much? The world would be probably pretty close to uninhabitable on land for life as we know it if it was not for that ozone layer. That first seemed to develop from that great oxidation of them, enough to protect the land, allow land life possible, which happened much later. Not only that, all that oxygen, one thing is, oxygen and methane and natural gas don't get along very well. Of course, if you heat it up, methane and oxygen burns and explodes. But even at room temperature, it will slowly react. If you put methane into our atmosphere now, half of it's gone in about 10 years. So it actually, by the same kind of burning process, except it's very, very slow. Now, the thing with methane, methane's a powerful greenhouse gas, about 20 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So little methane gives you a lot of greenhouse effect. Now, in these days, about two and a half, three billion years ago, the sun was fainter than it currently is. It was only about 80% as bright as it currently is. In our current atmosphere, if the sun was only 80% as bright as it currently is, the average global temperature would be about zero Fahrenheit, close to what you would see in, say, the Arctic the world would be mostly close to frozen over pole to pole. Not very good. So what kept that from happening? Well, carbon dioxide, there was a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but that's not sufficient to give you enough greenhouse warming to keep the planet above freezing temperatures. But add some methane in there, and it is. So we have a greenhouse effect of methane and oxygen keeping the world some two and a half to three billion years ago above freezing, even though the sun was a lot was noticeably fainter than it currently is. Now, all of a sudden, these darn photosynthesizers start throwing oxygen in the atmosphere. Methane levels drop because you're driving away the methanogens, the bacteria that produce them, and you're getting rid of the methane. Methane doesn't last long in oxygen. It lasts a long time when there's no oxygen around. When there is oxygen, it disappears in a decade or so. So now all of a sudden, methane levels go down, you lose a greenhouse effect, and guess what? Just about 2.2 billion years ago, we see a near global round of glaciations. Planet encased in ice almost from pole to pole. And that went on for 100 or 200 million years. Likely the cause of that was the decline of greenhouse gases <laughs> thanks to these darn photosynthesizers and that nasty oxygen waste product they kept on pumping in the atmosphere. As the sun slowly got warmer over time, it reached the tipping point in the, those massive ice ages. Had. But imagine having ice caps going all the way to, like, say, Central America. That's about what we have had in that first round of global glaciation. The planet changed darn close to freezing over completely. 
So here again, you see examples of living organisms having a dramatic effect on the global environment. And these oxygenic photosynthesizers were among the biggest and had among the biggest global impact. Now the interesting thing is, even in our own atmosphere, if all photosynthesis stopped, within several million years, all the oxygen in our atmosphere would be gone. We've got the capabilities now, it's only been done a few times, but we're rapidly approaching capabilities. We've found hundreds of planets around nearby stars now. On a few times, we've actually been able to detect atmospheric components. Not very often, once in a while. If we ever find a planet around another star that has substantial amounts of oxygen in its atmosphere, that strongly suggests that, that there is life, some type of photosynthetic life that is constantly pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, faster than geological process can take it out. That would be a place that if you have the technology, you would want to send a probe out there or call Captain Kirk and tell him to go out there. But that's something people are looking for. The presence of oxygen at high, high levels in a planetary atmosphere is a strong signature of life processes, specifically something like photosynthesis. So these guys, these photosynthesizers, literally changed the world. But they made our kind of life possible because our cells use so much energy that we need oxygen in our metabolism. It was a deadly toxin two and a half billion years ago or so, and it's essential for most life now. And it's the photosynthesizers that still keep the stuff at high levels in our atmosphere. 